Um, but next, I will introduce Kathleen Merrigan, Exec Executive Director of the Sweetie Center for Sustainable Food Systems at Arizona State University, to speak more on the promise of co-ops in creating uh, sustainable food systems. Kathleen? Yes, thank you. I realize that my, I, I don't have slides, it's just going to be me, just me as a person. Um, but uh, I realize that my background makes me look a little bit red, but I chose cranberries because Ocean Spray in Massachusetts is a cooperative, and so that seemed apropos. Um, let me begin with two things. First, and this was probably acknowledged yesterday, I didn't participate in your conference, but I really did want to do a shout out for Janie Hip, who's a dear friend. I'm so excited that the Senate confirmed her over the weekend, one of the most exciting appointments of the new administration. And also a congrats to Tony for her new role as CEO of NAF, so bravo. And I also want to start with a thanks. I now reside in Thirsty, Arizona. And there are others today and yesterday who are experts on the history of cooperatives in Indian country. My sense is that too many books skim over the history of cooperatives and Native Americans. Um, you know, a lot of history of hunting and farming cooperatives. Uh, and I certainly don't know all I should know, but as someone who lives in the Southwest now, I do want to acknowledge that my life here is possible because of cooperative projects to build irrigation canals by Indian farmers way back when. So today, um, Doug O'Brien, uh, thank you very much. We are dear friends, but you put me in a lineup after Administrator Neil. So our friendship's on the rocks right now because she was so great, so substantive, so energetic. I'm really excited she's at the helm there at USDA, but you can make it up to me over a beer at some point. Um, in my talk today, I will begin with defining cooperatives. Um, you may have gone through that before, but I wanna just restate, give you a bit of my history with the cooperative movement, and then turn to today, the politics of today. So in the midst of the pandemic and all kinds of relief bills in Congress, I suggest why I believe this could be and should be a cooperative moment. And finally, I just want to make the connection as to why I think cooperatives are essential to food system transformation. So first, as promised, the definition. So a cooperative, a user-owned and controlled business from which benefits are derived and distributed equitably on the basis of use. Cooperatives come in many forms, production, marketing, purchasing, service. The Cooperative Marketing Act of 1926 formalized USDA's service to cooperatives. I like to say that cooperatives are a pragmatic response to correct disparity in marketing power. They're tools to create economic development in communities. And there's structures that can enhance market efficiency and coordination. So my early engagement. Growing up, I vaguely knew about co-ops. My dad was a school teacher. He sold farm equipment down the street at Agway, an Agway store, which was a cooperative. And I didn't grow up too far from the Grange, but as far as I knew, it was simply a place where people did contra dancing. Like most young people today, I had no understanding of or appreciation for cooperative structures. And that's still something that worries me very much as I have all these students who are coming to my programs at Arizona State University and a couple of other universities where I've taught, all excited about getting their hands in the soil and their hands in policy making at the same time, working toward food, tra food system transformation. And this big piece of knowledge about cooperatives and the history of the cooperative movement has just not um, been a part of what they've learned today. And we have to think about how we address that. So in my background, I fast forward to graduate school and I was lucky enough to have former uh, uh, Secretary of Labor, Ray Marshall, 
who served under President Carter as a professor, and he was all about cooperatives. And to this day, I can still picture myself in his class as he went on and on about the most profitable steel company in America at that time, and it was a cooperative. He said, believe in the cooperative structure. He convinced me of the structure power and how cooperatives can create equity among workers. After graduation, I went to Washington, D.C. to work for the U.S. Committee on Agriculture, uh, the U.S. Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, thanks in part to the letter, uh, letters of recommendation from Ray and from former Congresswoman Barbara Jordan, also a professor of mine. I wanted to find a way in my work to tackle what these two great people had taught me. Ray Marshall focused on economic equity and Barbara Jordan focused on social equity and ethics. It, it wouldn't be uh, until writing the Organic Foods Production Act of 1990 that I interacted much with cooperatives. When the coalition came together to advocate for that bill, over the very strong opposition of traditional agriculture forces, the National Cooperative Business Association and the National Co-op Grocers helped in our grassroots organizing to secure the passage of the bill. The just emerging co-op co cooperative, the organization that's behind the Organic Valley label, was also by my side. It gave our effort credibility and it helped showcase how organic could contribute to economic health of small and mid-sized farms across the country. When I joined the USDA during the Clinton administration, I was administrator of the Agricultural Marketing Service. But I maintained my interest in cooperatives, particularly since I took on a project around fair contracting. And my sister agency at the time was GYPSA, which has since merged with AMS, but GYPSA is responsible for overseeing markets to make sure that they're fair and transparent. It just seemed to me that the little guys were always getting squeezed out, whether it was competing for a government procurement contract, trying to maintain some kind of control when raising chickens for some sort of big company that um, farmers are under contract to, or getting the kind of market transparency and intelligence that allows uh, operators to form successful strategies. Those were my concerns then. And uh, by the way, those are my concerns now. So where are we today? I believe in the power of cooperatives. I believe cooperation is an idea that works. And I like cooperatives big and small. Here are some statistics that I found on the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives website based on 2019 NAS data. And maybe this has been shared already in the proceedings to date, but it's worth just going over these big numbers um, again. So in 2019, total sales from cooperatives, $203 billion. Number of farmer members, 1.9 million. Value of assets owned by cooperatives, 100 billion. Number of cooperatives, 1,779. Jobs, 300,000. And net income, $7.8 billion. These are impressive numbers. But let's dig a little deeper. For me, cooperatives, again, are all about equity. When I had the opportunity to serve as Deputy Secretary at USDA, alongside Doug O'Brien working on all kinds of issues, particularly around building local and regional food systems. At the time, we coined our initiative, the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food Initiative. We realized that individuals alone were able to do the kind of investments and um, come up with strategies as solo operators. We began making USDA investments in things like food processing centers, community kitchens, 
food hubs, all that required a cooperative approach, even if not structured formally as a cooperative. But USDA, even at that time we were doing all of that, was cutting back on cooperatives with, by the way, the approval of Congress. When I left my post as deputy secretary after President Obama's first term, I went to work for CROP, AKA Organic Valley. It's the largest organic cooperative in the country with over a billion dollars in sales. Now, I wanna make the point that not all cooperatives are alike. Among the things that attracted me to the cooperative structure was the way farmers controlled the business. That is very much maintained at Organic Valley, at least when I was there working. I remember going to annual meetings and we would have to time it such that the Amish farmers uh, could travel from Pennsylvania to Wisconsin in their buggies to participate and to vote. In building cooperatives, we need to maintain the principle of equity. A couple of thoughts on fairness. Competition is in focus right now, largely because President Biden has called it out as a priority, not just in agriculture, looking across the country and saying, we need competition, we don't need monopolies, we do not need antitrust behavior. We had a failed attempt in the Obama years in combating anti-competitive practices in agriculture. There was a series of regional hearings, people got all dressed up for the party and the party never happened. I'm hoping in this new effort by the administration, we'll see people uh, get to the finish line and do something about what has rankled people across the country for decades. When I was a calling around to farm leaders last fall, competition was always among their top three priorities, but most often it was number one. Cooperatives are the other side of the coin. Cooperatives are allowing for a more diversified and uh, locally run uh, agriculture in the best of cases. And investing in cooperatives is another way, in dealing with competition, you have the very complicated legal messes in trying to deconstruct uh, what has been built up as a very consolidated agricultural system. The other way, about it, and you need both, is to build up competing kinds of structures like cooperatives. That is very important. Education. Uh, we need to educate members of Congress as to what cooperatives can bring to the table. I was looking at uh, National Cooperative Business Association's website where Doug O'Brien leads the effort uh, and they list the members of the bipartisan uh, House uh, member Congressional Cooperative Business Council. I'm really pleased that there is one, but disheartened to learn there are only 22 members to date. This is an opportunity to press our representatives to join and to learn. And then on education, as I mentioned earlier, in my younger years, uh, I knew nothing about cooperatives and today's youth know nothing about cooperatives. So I just really want to cheer on the organizers of this event for lifting up cooperatives and shining a light on their value in Indian country. So, so important. Um, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives has been very important in sharing the history of cooperative success, particularly for black farmers. We need a lot more of this and we need teachers of all sorts to weave in the cooperative story in their lessons. So pandemic aid, I was really grateful for Administrator Neal's helpful presentation and the highlighting of the $4 billion builder Build It Back Better initiative. Cooperatives should get a share of that bounty since they meet so many of the Biden-Harris stated goals. Uh, 
Administrator Neil mentioned meat processing. I also had that in my notes as a topic to raise this morning. I've always been interested in what has gone on in Quapaw Nation with their multi-species, uh, um, smaller scale slaughter facility. We need more of those kind of investments in Indian country. Uh, and I think the time is ripe for that. The administrator mentioned the deadline, the end of this month for submission of comments to the request that USDA has made in the federal register. And if everybody writes back and says, Indian country is well suited for these kinds of investments, maybe uh, that will bring about good things. But I also wanna say that $4 billion is a drop in the bucket of the money that has been sent out to American agriculture in the last two or three years. Uh, it began as money out to um, make up for tariff wars that were begun by the last administration. And more recently, it's uh, a succession of pandemic aid packages. Uh, Four billion is great, and we should do all we can to um, do great things with that money. But we also need to continue on the on with the work to convince policymakers that uh, food system transformation is necessary, and we need to radically change how we put out public dollars and what public goals we are um, seeking to achieve with those dollars. We have a new infrastructure bill um, getting uh, a lot of attention and making its way through the system. And maybe there we'll also see some great money for uh, cooperative development um, across the country in good ways. I wanna mention a report that the Sweetie Center where I work just came out with. Um, it's called the my own report, let me get the title straight. The critical to-do list for organic agriculture, 46 recommendations for the president, uh, 46 because President Biden is the 46th president. And among the many recommendations in that report is finding a way to have group certification or tribal nation certification for organic. When I think about how so many practices that are essential for organic farmers and ranchers and their origin, oftentimes that is uh, you know, really brilliant thinking in Indian country. And yet so few native producers uh, benefit from the organic uh, certification system that we have in our country. And I really want to think about how we get there and do something about it. Just the number of acres that um, tribal nations oversee, um, the economic opportunity that organic presents for uh, native growers, particularly because we know we import so much organic food that we could uh, grow here domestically. $2.5 billion last year of imported food. Now, some of it's coffee and certain spices and tropical fruits that we'll never produce in any kind of substantial quantity here in this country. But a lot more of it is stuff that could be grown in uh, the US by producers at a small scale and hopefully uh, within cooperative structures. So uh, take a look at that report. It's on our website. I'd really love uh, feedback on the thinking around how we help Indian country and organic um, come together. I've been a part of a lot of food system dialogues across the globe, getting ready for the Food Systems Summit in New York City this fall. I'm hoping that cooperative thinking is infused in this world summit that will occur um, I expect it will be a priority topic among civil society organizations from other parts of the globe. I'm not sure how much is bubbling up from the US and from USDA in particular, but I think there's opportunity there. Looking ahead, uh, we have um, come together as a world to develop the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 of them. 
And when I think about food and agriculture, food and agriculture are essential to every single one of those goals, even uh, sustainable cities with all the growth in urban agriculture or um, gender equity, knowing that the world's farmers are mostly women. Um, it's not just sustainable development goal two, zero hunger, it's every single one of the 17 goals. We are in a moment, uh, friends, that everyone is rethinking food systems. The pandemic really um, caused people to wake up to uh, our food system vulnerabilities. And in some cases, uh, sh shined a light on how the food system works in ways that people were unaware. I was recently in Washington DC with a couple of major agricultural journalists who said, we had no idea that the food system, uh, the food chain distribution was so bifurcated with a lot of our food going to institutional food uh, vendors and the rest going into the grocery store chain, for example. So this is a moment where everyone is a little off balance, realizing what they thought they knew is not exactly all that they need to know and the opportunity to press forward a new agenda that truly can transform our food systems at a time when climate change is challenging us at a time when social equity thankfully is a center stage issue the opportunity right now is really great and so i hope everyone raises their voices uh, says in chorus, this is a cooperative moment and we make something from it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathleen. I really appreciate your presentation today. And um, We do have a couple of questions that have come through and I'd love to be able to um, ask those of you and, and Dr. Neal as well. Um, one question that came through uh, for Kathleen, uh, kind of rolling two questions into one. Um, so what, the question was, what is your advice for individual tribal producers who think a cooperative could benefit their operations, but don't know where to start. And maybe you could also speak to what the Sweetie Center could do to help support those producers um, build more sustainable practices. Sure, well, first of all, if you're interested in um, looking at meat processing cooperatives, it's something that the Sweetie Center has been thinking a lot about and would be really happy to help with design of feasibility studies. So I know that's something that I've talked to NAF colleagues about, um, and there's, there's such opportunity there. Low hanging fruit, in my opinion. But where do you start uh, if you wanna start a cooperative? Well, I know Doug, Doug's organization can help with that. USDA has technical assistance, but um, being a professor, what can I say? The first thing I would do is start by just reading some of the history of cooperatives and learn from history. Too often we are ahistorical in our work and particularly in our policy work. And uh, I always find that I like to know the history of an idea because that allows me to shape it for the needs of today. Great. Okay. And I'll, okay. yeah, I'll just add real quickly. I think, you know, they're um, being intentional around the cooperative development centers. There was a link to the list of centers and the materials that I provided. Those might be able to be a good spot uh, to start to talk with folks about how to set up that cooperative or determining if that cooperative structure is right for what they're trying to do. Um, and then, uh, as, as uh, Professor Morgan said as well, you know, go into the state offices for rural development. They can help connect you to the technical assistance services that we provide directly. Um, we'd love to have even more folks who are providing technical assistance around cooperatives throughout our state offices. We're not quite there like we used to be in the past, but we're working on um, improving that. But definitely folks can reach out as well to our providers. Great, thank you, Dr. Neal. And just as a note, I know we've shared um, references to several links and, and resources. So I believe some of our team members and as well as the uh, NCBA CLUSA have been including some of those links in the chat box. For example, I believe the 46 recommendations um, report is included in there. I know that a link to Dr. Neal's presentation as well with some of those links included are gonna be uh, housed on that website. They're available to you to access at a later time. Um, I do have one more uh, just kind of follow-up question. Um, I believe it came through um, in reference to um, 
need, you know, there's potentially going to be coming down the line more funding opportunities for the infrastructure bill that are tribally designated funds. Um, where is the best place to find more information um, on potential funding opportunities for broadband, water infrastructure, or like things like climate adapt adaptation? Um, like, where do they start to find that information? So as you can imagine, that work is is pretty new. Um, that that bill is pretty new. So those those uh, guidelines and what is going to be available, what that's going to look like, what the structure that those that assistance can be has not yet been determined. Um, again, I would say I mean, it sounds sound like a broken record, but I think those state offices again, they, those are the best place to start. So you know, go into them, stay in touch with them. A to provide some feedback, right? So if there are things that you know you're seeing, and, and uh, there was a question in the chat that had to do with water, and I was able to direct that to our our um, a, a acting administrator for rural utility service. But you know, if, those, if there are those kinds of things that folks want to provide feedback on, they should feel free to do so. And again, there, so I would say go to the state offices, they can tell you what's going on at, at, when that information becomes available. The other thing I would say is if you go to USDA's website on their communications page, you can sign up for various types of reminders. So you can just get that information automatically. So you'll find out when those announcements are happening, you'll be the, one of the first people to know in that situation. That's another thing to be able to do, sign up for those alerts. Right. And I'll just add to that, the administrator has done such a good job pointing to all the resources, but when I go back to the 2018 Farm Bill, I'm just really exhilarated by the successes that the Native Farm Bill Coalition had in that legislation. So, um, you know, there's the, the strategy of waiting to see what shapes up at USDA, how this money comes out the door and applying. There's also the more active approach where tribal nations come together, whether it's through the um, Intertribal Ag Council or what have you, where you try to shape what's happening in the moment to make sure that you're set up for success when the ink dries. So I say with all this money coming out the door, take whether, whatever opportunities that are, there are to submit comments, when USDA has calls in the Federal Register, to talk to members of Congress, to put together papers that say, these are the top priorities in Indian country for infrastructure, for whatever, um, and already um, be getting readied for the 2023 Farm Bill. It may not have as much money as we're seeing going out the door right now with all the pandemic uh, relief and the the infrastructure bill, but it's never too early to start. So I'm going to be cheering on Indian country, and I hope that the 2018 successes uh, are are just the first step in what's going to be a really different reality in terms of the priorities at USDA around Native issues. 